This is the introductory video uh, for uh, U.S. History 1, History 1100 uh, at Robert Morris University. Uh, this, this, this video effectively replaces Syllabus Monday. It's the Syllabus Monday version for an online class. Uh, so we just want to go over the syllabus and the organization of the course and how the course is going to work and what we're going to cover. Okay, uh, I suppose uh, operatively, the first thing that we want to worry about is the requirements of the course. Our course, there's 500 points in the course, and we'll go over grading in just a second here and how we, how we uh, are going to establish grades. But there's 500 points in the course. Okay, the, the first we'll deal with, and you might want to take a look if you go online to your Blackboard, you take a look at the syllabus. This is, you can follow right along with what we're talking about uh, if you follow out the syllabus. Uh, the first uh, requirement are going to be the examinations. Uh, and uh, for the examinations, there's uh, 150 points. There's three exams, 50 points each. Uh, at the end of each epoch, uh, and I'll get into that in just a second. So there's going to be three exams, 50 points each. That's 150 points. We're then going to have 10 discussions interspersed. Uh, this will be on the discussion board on, on Blackboard. Uh, interspersed throughout the semester, we'll have 10 of these. There'll be 25 points apiece. That'll be 250 points which if you do the percentages works out to 50% of the grade. The exams will then be 30% of the grade. Uh, and then there's an essay. Everybody will write one three to five page essay, pay very close attention, read in the syllabus, because uh, I'm very strict about the formatting of it. Uh, it's three to five pages, double spaced, typewritten. Of course, you're going to be submitting it online, so it has to be typewritten, just in case you wanted to write it by hand and then scan it into your computer. Don't do that. We're not, that doesn't fly. Um, and that's worth 100 points, okay, uh, for a total of 500 points. Now, I, I mentioned uh, just before the development of these uh, into epochs. What we do is we break uh, the, US, the U.S. History 1 course follows from the early days of colonization, okay, through the end of the period known as Reconstruction just after the Civil War, roughly from the latter part of the 16th century. The founding of Jamestown is 1607. That's largely where we start out, is in that period, that colonial period, all the way through to 1877 and the end of Reconstruction. So there's a large period of time that this course covers. It's one of the difficulties with the course is there's an awful lot of material. And so as instructors, we always have to de determine what we're going to cut out and what we're going to bring in. Uh, I am a political economist. My, my degrees... Uh, and my study and my research interests are all on political economy, which is the relationship of politics and economics. And so largely we look at the political and economic developments of the United States uh, during this period. Um, and then we divide that into three general panels or epochs or epochs. Okay? Uh, the first of them is going to take us from the early days of colonization up through the ratification of the United States Constitution in 1789. The second of them brings us largely to a period that we would call the Mexican Session after the, the uh, Mexican-American War in 1848, uh, and that's going to divide the second panel. And the reason largely that that's going to divide the second panel, and we'll get into it in class as we develop classes, after that point, uh, the war between the states, you'll see, you'll notice that I interchangeably use war between the states and civil war, uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that, because from, from the field of political science, conflicts break down into several different categories, and there are several different features that render a conflict, so that there are civil wars, there are separatist wars. What the, what the American Civil War was was a separatist war, uh, and technically speaking, it's really an international war because the Confederate States of America secede from the United States and form their own republic known as the Confederate States of America, and so really they're an independent country. Yeah, uh, technically speaking. So it's really not the same kind of civil war that we see, for example, in the Biafran uh, civil war in Nigeria or in the Democratic Republic of Congo currently. Those are more civil wars. Um, but at any rate, so that period is roughly 1848, 1850, that area. Uh, and after the Mexican session, after the, the, the territory that's conquered from Mexico, uh, most notably the current southwestern part of the United States, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, California. Uh, after that period, it's pretty much deadlocked that the Civil War is going to happen because that 
completely disrupts the balance of power in the Senate between those who favored a stronger national government and those who favored a somewhat weaker national government. What often gets, uh, and we'll see as we go through the semester, why this is incorrect. Uh, it gets degenerated into slave states and non-slave states. That's not entirely correct, though, and we'll go over why that is. Uh, a lot of people think that the American Civil War, the war between the states, was all about slavery, and slavery was an issue, no, no doubt about that, but it was a, a, a minor issue in comparison to some of the others that we'll take a look at, most notably the division of sovereignty between the national level and the regional level known as, as the states. Um, so that'll be the second epic, and then the, se the third epic, covers from that period through the war between the states uh, and through the period of Reconstruction. At the end of each of those panels, at the end of each of those ebooks, you'll have an exam. The exam is only 50 points. Uh, it's not going to be multiple choice. I don't do multiple choice. I thought about doing multiple choice because it makes my life a lot easier online because the computer will just grade them for me and assign points. But the fact is I don't like multiple choice. I don't like multiple choice because, well, ultimately, multiple choice doesn't test what you know. Multiple choice tests what you don't know. When you think about a multiple choice question, the answer is there. Okay? You're, you're already being given the answer, so it's kind of a pointless enterprise. Uh, and the second thing that has always bothered me with multiple choice is that it, the, the hypothetical possibility exists that if you were to cha train a chimpanzee to use a pencil and to fill in a little bubble, uh, that they could actually pass the test. Uh, you think about it, a, a chimpanzee could actually graduate ultimately with a degree from Robert Morris uh, if you were to only do multiple choice tests. So we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is short answer tests. Okay, 50 points. I'm thinking it's probably going to be 10 questions, 5 points each, and you get an hour. Now, on, on Blackboard, I, I set up the parameters of the exam. Now, the parameters I'm setting up is that it's, one, forced completion, meaning you can't go in, do a little bit of it, save it, and then come back another time. You have to finish it in one sitting, so you're going to have to carve out enough time to take that exam. The timing is also rigidly enforced at 60 minutes. So you have to carve out a 60-minute block to take that exam. Um, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be set to auto-submit, meaning that at the end of 60 minutes, whether you're finished or not, it's going to submit the test, and your score is your score at that point. Okay, uh, you don't get multiple attempts. You get one shot at it. Uh, and another thing that, that I want to uh, make clear Okay, that I did with my U.S. History 2 online class and my microeconomics classes, it is understood. The test is designed, okay, and it is understood that when you sit down to take that test, you have in front of you, at ready access, all materials covered on the test. We do not do cumulative tests. There will be no cumulative final. You will have a test at the end of each of the panels and each of the epics, okay, that will cover that epic, okay? Uh, and so you don't have to worry about it. Once it's done, you don't have to worry about it again. You just go on to the next subject. All right. So that's the exams. That's 150 points, 3 times 50. Okay. Then we have the discussions that are going to be interspersed. Now, the discussions, what I've done with the discussions most of the discussion questions, okay, because I teach this class on ground as well. And in the on ground class, their exams are divided into three sections, the last of which is essay questions. Your discussion questions are largely drawn and are, are, are uh, amalgamates of the essay questions for the on ground class. Okay, there will be 10 of them worth 25 points apiece. Now, when they're going to hit, is they're going to hit the oh uh, one thing but before I go any further the the examinations the examinations are going to be available for the week in other words to to just go back to the exams for just a second the first panel okay epic one which carries us to the ratification of the United States Constitution in 1789 is going to take us five weeks okay the exam is then made available on Blackboard at the end of that fifth week. Our weeks run generally from Monday at 0800 until Sunday at 1159, with the exception of the last week, uh, which is going to end on Friday. Okay? So, 
it's going to be made available at the end of the fifth week, after we've covered all the material. By the end of the fifth week, by Sunday at midnight, okay, by, by Sunday of the fifth week at midnight, and I can't remember exactly what date that is, but at, at Sunday, at the end of the fifth week at midnight, you should have consumed all of the material from those five weeks, okay? That's what you want to set in your mind, all right? From then until the following Sunday at midnight, you will have that amount of time. The test will be available for that amount of time. So sometime during that week, you need to carve yourself out 60 minutes of time to take that exam in one sitting. Okay? Clear enough? Now, with the discussions, it's a little bit different. The discussions, you'll also have a week. The discussions will be made available at Monday at 0800 and will be due no later than the following Sunday at midnight. So again, you'll have pretty close to seven days. Okay, you'll have it from the beginning of the week at 0800 on a Monday until the following Sunday at midnight. The difference is that they are not timed. You will have as much time as you like to answer the question. They will not be forced completion. So you can write something, save it, and then come back later and finish it off. So you don't have to carve out a time to finish the entire discussion question. Although I suspect most of you will. Most of you will just sit down and write it out uh, after you've gotten your thoughts. Now, the thing about the discussions is... They're going to be available for the week after we discuss the topic that the discussion uh, relates to, okay? In other words, I'll give you an example, okay? I'll give you an example. The first discussion topic we talk about asks you for the difference, to, to define the differences between the colonies established by England, by Great Britain, and those established by Spain, France, and Holland. Okay, well, we're going to cover that in the first week. You'll then write the answer to that question. You'll then enter into the discussion board, okay, and write your response to the discussion in the second week. Okay, otherwise, if we do it in the same week, it, I thought about this, and if we do it in the same week, it doesn't make any sense. Because if you're going to have from Monday at 0800 until Sunday at 1159, 2359 hours, okay, to write that discussion, well, you also have that same amount of time to consume the material. Assuming that you that you consume the material through the week, that's going to leave you short in actually writing a response. So you're actually going to write a response to the discussion after you've consumed the material. So you're going to be a week behind on all the discussions. Okay, the discussion will be from the previous week's work. Okay, and they're 25 points apiece, 10 of them, total of 250 points. All right, and you'll see as they as, as you go and you look at the discussions what we're working at, uh, and 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 uh, we'll give you some help. I'll give you some help on those as we go along, and you'll see what I'll do with each of the discussions with 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 these things. I generally have a rubric. I have an out in outline form. I have basically what I'm looking for in the discussion, uh, and after you've submitted it, then I'll send it out to you. Probably as an email, I'll send it out to you so you can see where you missed and what we're looking for. Uh, these discussions are not opinion. Opinionated. They're, they're not designed on opinion. It's not your opinion. It's it, You have to back up what you're saying, okay? Uh, and so they're, they're much more specific, uh, and, and they require uh, uh, knowledge of the material. That's the whole point behind them. Uh, and then the third thing on which you're going to be evaluated is an essay. Now, everyone is going to write one of two essays. There are two essays in the class. Okay, and they're they're in the terms of their subject matter, they're almost identical, uh, except they deal with different periods. The first one is on the precipitatory causes of the Revolutionary War. The second one is on the precipitatory causes of the war between the states. Okay, as I said, they're three to five pages. They're one inch margins, Times New Roman font, twelve, uh, and one half of the class, either the top half or the bottom half, will be assigned essay one. Now, when you think about it, once one half of the class, the class will be divided in half. One half will do essay one, one half will do essay two. Once essay one is assigned to either of the halves of the class, that by default automatically assigns essay two to the other half of the class. Okay? Understood? Um, now, uh, that's worth 100 points. It will be graded on comprehensiveness. In other words, including all the relevant material that can be brought to bear on the discussion of the topic of the essay. Uh, 
coherency, meaning that it's written in a way that I can read it, that it's not got sentence fragments and it's not got typos, uh, and then concision, which means that it's written, there's, it's not verbose, okay? You'll find that that's not the case. With both of these essays, there's an awful lot of material that has to be brought into it. You'll have a maximum of five pages uh, to bring that to bear, uh, and you will find that you're going to need all five of those pages. If you if you write one of these essays and you, you're at two pages, then it's obvious that you've missed all kinds of things. These are fairly comprehensive. And they're 100 points. Okay? So that's another 100. So when you add that together, you got 100, 150 for the exams, 250 for the discussions, you've got 500 points. Now, in addition, there's extra credit. The extra credit is a maximum of 50 points. You don't just automatically get the 50 points. You, in fact, automatically get nothing. Okay, if you write extra credit and it's absolute crap, you're going to get zero for it. Okay, and the extra credit, this was actually suggested by a history student years and years ago, back in like aught nine or something like that, uh, when I first started doing histories at Robert Morris. Uh, I, I originally, when I was at Robert Morris for the first seven years, taught economics. And so there's a large economic component. We'll, we'll discuss that in just a second uh, in the class. But I used to teach economics, micro, macro, that kind of thing, uh, survey of economics international trade theory, whatever. Uh, but at any rate, <laughs> um, when I first started doing histories, one of, the, one of the history students suggested to me this as an extra credit. We were talking about extra credit in the class, and one of them came up with this as an idea for extra credit. And it was a really good idea. It's a really good idea, and I've kept it since. For a maximum possible of 50 points, not a guaranteed 50 points, don't get crazy on me, okay? you write the off essay. Now, what I mean by that is if you're in, in, in the group that is assigned essay one, that means it is mandated that you write essay one worth 100 points. It will be out of 100 points, okay? The off essay then would be essay two. It's the essay that you're not assigned to do, that's not mandated. If you write that one as well, you can get a maximum of 50 extra credit points, which is 10% of the grade. If you do the math, that's 10% of the grade. Okay? Uh, now, the, with both essays now, okay, it, it, we, we have this first group that's assigned essay one, which means this second group is assigned essay two. Well, the group that's assigned essay two, if they want to do extra credit, which is to say they write the off essay, which would be essay one, it has to be submitted uh, at the same time as everybody else writes essay one. They don't get extra time on it. Um, and, uh, okay, now, that is the requirements. That's how the course works. Now, as to how the course is going to operate, that's how you're evaluated. Now, how it's going to operate. Your main interface, you're going to go on to Blackboard. Your main interface, when you go onto your Blackboard for this class, and you go over to the left-hand side of the screen, you're going to see a number of things. Most notably and most critically, you're going to see the weekly breakdown of the class. Week one, week two, week three, week four, all the way down. You'll notice that there is no week 14. Why is there no week 14? Because week 14 is Thanksgiving break. And I see absolutely no reason whatsoever, despite the fact that this is an online class, I see no reason whatsoever that we don't take a break on week 14 as well. All the on-ground guys take week 14 off, so in week 14 of the semester, there will be no requirements, there will be nothing due, there will be no assignments, no discussions, no exams, no anything. Okay? And so when you go over there, you'll see week 14 is gone. It goes week 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way down, and then it skips 14, 13, then 15. That's going to be your main interface for the class, okay? So when you first go on there, you're going to go on. To, you're going to click on week one. Week one's going to have this video. It's going to have the text reading for the week. Uh, it's going to have uh, the PowerPoint for the week, and I'll go over that in just a second. Uh, it's going to have the PowerPoint that we're dealing with, uh, and it's going to have some additional web links. Primarily, the additional web links that I bring to bear in this class are from two different uh, internet sources. The one is a very good one, ushistory.org. 
and you can punch in that anytime you like, and it's not difficult to navigate your way through. I give you the precise web link to go to. It covers U.S. history. It covers the same kind of subject that we're dealing with, U.S. history. Um, and you'll see a number. And in fact, if you look at the syllabus, it will tell you the additional web link. It'll tell you U.S. history, you know, number one, number two, uh, number five, number six, number seven. It's they're numbered. You'll see, and you can just click when you go into the, to, to that area. If you just click on the web link, now if there's more than one of them, they'll be in a folder called ushistory.org links. Okay, click on that folder. You'll see the web links. You click on one of those web links. It'll take you right to the web pages that you need. Most of these are four or five pages long. Uh, what it'll be is it'll be a number and then, you know, A, B, C, D, and E, and you read through all of those. Uh, and that basically, that doesn't replace the text reading, nor neither does it replace the PowerPoint. Those are our two main driving forces is the text and the PowerPoints, but it amplifies and reinforces them. They'll discuss on ushistory.org, they'll discuss things that I don't discuss sometimes. Uh, I'll discuss things with greater emphasis than they do, but the two things will work together very nicely. Now, the other source is actually a really, really, really fun source of history. I bumped into this. I bumped into this because here's, here's how this works. I'll explain this, okay? A couple of years back, okay, I was doing U.S. histories, and then I stopped doing U.S. histories, and I started doing some political science for the social science guys. Then I went back to doing U.S. history, and in the intervening years, they changed textbooks on me, and the textbook that they gave me was horrible. Now, we've since gotten rid of that. We only had that for two years. We've since gotten rid of that, but it was really bad, and so I said, I'm not using this book, which was fine, because it was a crap textbook. But it robbed me of the maps that I used, particularly with the conflicts in American history. Okay, most notably the Revolution and the Civil War, but also the Mexican War and things like that. And so I went online to search for a site that had detailed maps of the American conflicts. And I bumped into the motherload site. They're still working on it. Okay, they've only got a few things up there, but they don't, it's not comprehensive, but it's got what we need. Okay, it's it's historyanimated.org um, or historyanimated.com. I give you the exact web link. Uh, but what it is, is it's animated, detailed analysis of every campaign and every battle in every war. Okay, so like in the Revolutionary War, we're going to go battle by battle, campaign, campaign to look at the strategy and tactics employed by both the Americans and the British during the conflict to see why the conflict resulted the way it did. Okay. Because it was a bit of an upset. We're also going to do the same thing for the Civil War. So that's our second. And you'll see, as you go through the weeks, okay, we cover the American Revolution in week four. You'll see, you'll click on, on week four. You'll see the text. You'll see the PowerPoint. You'll see the history org link. And then you'll see history animated links. Click on that folder, and you'll see a whole slew of them that go through the battles. Okay? Um, and that's what we do, because one of the discussion questions is going to ask you about the different strategies employed. So you want to, and it's actually quite good fun. When I first, it's kind of funny, when I first reviewed it, I didn't realize it had sound, and then I did it in the history class one time. I do, I, I use the same web links, uh, in my on ground class, uh, and I found out that it has sound, and it's cool sound, because like when they have cavalry marching, you hear the sound of horses' hooves moving, and you hear drum beats. It's wonderful. It's a great site. I turned, I turned, uh, Professor Fanning, for those of you who know Professor Fanning, I turned him onto the site, uh, cause it's just a tremendous site for, for, for history, particularly if you're into military history. And we do cover military history. That's one of my other interests. Um, in fact, that's why, you know, I'm the, I'm the Robert Morris world geographer. And the reason I'm the world geographer is because I know geography. The reason I know geography is because I had to study it in my pursuit of the study of mil military history. Uh, but at any rate, Okay, so those are going to be the additional links. And so what you'll basically do is you'll go in there. I'll send out an announcement when we begin class. We begin class this Saturday. We really aren't going to, st we, we, we begin class on Saturday. You can get in there and start looking around. Um, uh, and, and I'll send out an announcement and probably send out an email as well to tell you how to go through things. First thing you're going to do is go to week one and just start in. Okay. Now you're going to see over on the left also up high above where the weekly breakdown is, you'll see two, two content areas. You'll see discussions and all of our discussions are listed there too. 
Okay, what I've done is we're, we're, whatever week we're doing the discussion, uh, in the weekly breakdown, I put a course link that will throw you up to the discussions. You don't have to go to the discussion board. You can if you want. You can click on either one and write your discussion. It doesn't matter. Okay, uh, but if you want to just stick with the weekly breakdown, you just click on that and it'll take you to the course. It'll be a course link that'll take you to the discussion board. Um, for whatever relevant week it is. And you'll also see essays. Now, the essays are going to be submitted, and the syllabus says this, they're going to be submitted via Turnitin. Okay? Uh, the essays are there, and if you click on essays over there on the left-hand side above where the weekly breakdown is, you click on essays, you'll see essay one, essay two. When it comes your time to write the essay, that's where you'll go. OK, uh, and it says the dates that they're made available in the syllabus. It's very clear when they're due. The one is due. Let me see. The one is due at the end of the fifth week. I think like the 27th of September, something the 25th of September. I think it's due. Uh, and the other one is due at, I think, the end of the 12th week, sometime in November. Uh, but check out the syllabus. It's very it's very specific as to when they're due. And I hold you. I mean, that that's at that point, those essays are no longer available. So if you don't get it in by that time, you get a zero. OK, uh, and you can't afford that. That's 20 percent of the grade. OK, that covers what we're dealing with in the class. Um, we'll start with week one. If there's anything I've forgotten, I'll include it in you in an email. Uh, I, I heartily encourage you that the challenge in an online course. OK, there's a couple of things just you know, at the end here uh, by way of conclusion that I want to cover in terms of an online course. One of the more difficult things in an online course, okay, is to try to create the interaction that is inherent in an on-ground course. In other words, in an on-ground course, I see you guys all the time, either twice a week or three times a week. I'm a Monday, Wednesday, Friday guy. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I see you guys all the time. We can interact. We can talk. We can discuss the class. We can discuss matters pertaining to the class, whatever, okay? Online, that's a little bit difficult. That's a little bit different because we, we, I mean, maybe we don't see each other. That's the whole point of online is that it's more convenient for students that uh, have busy lives, busy schedules. They can't get to class. They can't make that class at a certain time because of scheduling conflict, whatever. Uh, and so we want to try to replace that interaction. So you are heartily encouraged to ferret me out. Uh, as much as you possibly can to email me. I respond to emails generally within 24 hours. My time for, I usually check my email a couple of times a day, depending on what time of the semester is like busier times of the semester during midterms and like that. I'll check it more frequently, but I always check it first thing in the morning. I'm usually up by about four 30 or five o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, and it's what I call holding court. I hold court. I go in and I check my, my Robert Morris email right away. And I generally respond within 24 hours. Uh, I've heard tales of faculty that respond weeks later or not at all. Uh, and I find that deplorable. I respond very quickly. Uh, and any of you who've ever experienced this know or have written me emails know that I, I respond very quickly. It's uh, disrespectful to students not to. Um, but at any rate, uh, and so that's one. The other thing is, uh, as I said, I teach Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So I'm on campus. I'm on campus usually in the afternoons. My classes are in the afternoons. I teach. I'm doing my, my uh, on-ground world geography uh, is at 2.45, 2, 2.45 to 3.35. And then my on-ground history section, uh, which is full, 50 people, um, I think there's 51 now, uh, is, from, is immediately following that. It's from 3.45 to 4.35. Uh, now, I'm adjunct which means my office is in 305 Hale. I spend absolutely no time in that office. The reason I spend absolutely no time, no time in that office, when I was a graduate assistant back at Miami University, I had a better office than that. I mean, when I was a graduate assistant, I actually had an office of my own. So I'm not, I, I just, I, I don't want to sit there. It, it's just, when the weather is nice, I spend a lot of time outside. When the weather is nice, now we were the fall semester, the weather is going to be nice until really towards the end of the semester. I'm outside. I'll generally arrive at school a little before two, probably around quarter to two in the afternoon, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I'm outside. Where I'll be is, if you're familiar with campus at all, uh, between Hale and Franklin, there are the flagpoles. That's where I am, okay? Uh, I'm generally sitting in the grass by the cherry trees. Uh, but at any rate, um, when the weather's not nice, 
I find office space sometimes. Sometimes I, I find a place to put myself. If it's raining, if it's too cold, I'll go into the Nicholson Center. Or a lot of times I go to Franklin. Uh, the easiest way to do that is if you want to meet with me. And I, I, last semester I met with a lot, uh, several of my history students uh, that were online students that, that nonetheless were still traditional students that were on campus. They just couldn't take the class when they wanted to. Uh, and I'd meet with them. Basically, you send me an email saying, "Let's, we need to get together. I need to go over some of this stuff with you face-to-face. -face. Uh, and then we just arrange a time and a place to meet. Um, and that's that works out fine, too. Um and now the second thing with online classes that I have to forewarn you of, and if you've done online classes, you know this. Online classes, oftentimes, and this is one of the difficulties at Robert Morris that we've dealt with, sometimes students think that an online class is going to be easier. They think it's going to be a blow-off class because there's no actual classroom time. Such is not the case. In fact, quite the contrary. Online classes require more of the students, not less, because online classes are for self-motivated students. I, I'm not, I can't sit there with a blowtorch at you all the time, forcing you to do things. Okay, this is going to be self-motivated for the first, for, for the most part. Um, and so that's one of the difficulties with an online class. It's not a blow-off class. When you start going through the weekly breakdown, you'll see there's a lot of stuff in there. It's not difficult. It's not terribly difficult. Okay. And then, oh, the final thing I want to mention uh, just before I quit here. The, the main instruction of the class, how I do this, is you're going to see something else in the weekly breakdown, starting with week one. You'll see the PowerPoint there. That PowerPoint is your straightforward PowerPoint that would be presented to an on-ground class. Okay. You'll want to punch the boot that up. Underneath that, you're going to see a web link. The web link is to a YouTube video. What those YouTube videos are, are they are narrated versions of those PowerPoints. All they are simply stated is that PowerPoint with me narrating and explaining the PowerPoint over the top. Okay? Uh, and we go right through it. Now, what I'm going to do is the PowerPoint itself okay, is of various lengths. The first one, I think, has 32 slides or something like that. This semester, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Last semester, for my U.S. History 2 guys, if you know any of those, some of those lectures, like the one on the United States during the Second World War, they were like an hour and 45 minutes long. We're not going to do that, okay? We're going to go, uh, the, these, these, power, these narrated videos on YouTube are going to be between 45 and 50 minutes. And at the end of 45 and 50 minutes, I'm done, because that's your normal class length. On a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, that's your normal class length. And we'll just simply split it. So what you'll see is you'll see, like in week one, you'll see PowerPoint 1.1, referring to Epic 1, PowerPoint 1, 1.1. But then you'll see in the lecture that it's broken down to A, B, maybe even C. I'm not sure how long, because I haven't done them yet. And that's the, the, the lectures aren't up there yet. Okay, they're going to get built as we go along, as, as we go along, and as I decide what we need, what we need more emphasis on, etc., we're going to build those as we go along. Um, and so you'll see PowerPoint 1.1, that's the straightforward PowerPoint that you would present in class. You'll click that, maybe you'll download it, maybe you'll print it out so that you have it hard copy next to you. I would encourage you to do that. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Uh, and set your printer so that it prints out three slides. Probably the best. It's up to you. I mean, that's up to you, but it's probably the best way to do it. Uh, and then go in and listen to the lecture. You'll see 1.1a, 1.1b, etc and start there and then listen to the lecture and you'll have the slides with you so you can go through the slides listen to the lecture and the nice thing about it being on the YouTube videos like this which you can't do in an on-ground class is at any point in time you can pause the video you can go back and listen to another section of it in on-ground classes you can't do that when I'm sitting there lecturing my on-ground class they can't stop me they can't say stop pause you know, go back five minutes, tell, tell me that. No, it's just, that's the way it is. Uh, and so it's actually a little more convenient doing this. Uh, and it's actually quite good fun. Um, so you'll have that. That's the main driving force, in fact, of the class. That's what's going to... Uh, but that's, that's going to be the class. If there are any questions, email me with them. Uh, I think that should clarify just about everything. And by the second and third week of the class, you'll get the feel for how the class flows. Uh, 
that's what we're going to do. And again, I encourage you to contact me at any time through email. Uh, my sil The syllabus also has my phone number on it. Um, okay, that's it.